some theories, and there are many, in fact most of them, uh, work by chopping things up into little units and then reconstructing whatever you're thinking about in those little units. That's a wonderful thing because it gives clarity. And what we call science in the society is based on that way of proceeding. You take whatever it is you're studying and you chop it up into units as carefully as you can and whatever's left over gets lost. Sorry, we can't deal with that. But the units are extremely valuable because what you reconstruct out of them is clear. And with that model you can build airplanes, and with that model you can build automobiles, and you can build computers, and you can build uh, uh, microphones that carry over there. So don't say that that's uh, no good. Say, you know, I, I think uh, people are silly who are writing on computers that uh, science is no good. You know, I mean, that's absurd. <laughs> And then they fly on airplanes to conventions to say that sort of thing. <laughs> now, there is, however, another very different approach to everything. Very roundly, you can call it the holistic approach. This one is most familiar today uh, in ecology. This is the approach that says nothing is ever a unit. Everything is always the whole. No matter what you touch is really not the just that, but also this, and also that, and also that, and pretty soon you have to consider everything. And that is a very different approach. Do you follow that? Yeah. Now, it's philosophy, what we're doing here, to talk about not theories, but kinds of theories. Do you follow? Are you getting dizzy? No. OK. <laughs> then there is a third approach, which, I which uh, deals with functional wholes, that is to say, uh, a person, a relationship, a situation, a field, a something that is a whole and inside of that it's a whole. But you don't have to bring in everything all the time. Now you can tell if I think if I stop right here that we need all three of them, right? Now most of the time philosophy hasn't said that. that you can use all three of them. Most of the time in history, philosophy is one of these, or one of these, or one of these. Because with these three, you can, with any of them, even one of them, you can really go to town. You can really analyze theories instead of what they're about, which is somebody else's field. In philosophy, you're not interested in what the theory is about so much. You're interested in what kind of theory it is, how it's put together, what kind of thinking that is. Because without that, you're not going to get anywhere, anyhow, on your content. Am I, uh, am I making sense? Well, that part is a little hard. Let me see, how do I say that? Uh, as, a, as a theorist, I know some things in psychology. I know very little, but a little bit in anthropology. I know a little bit about a lot of fields. You know, I know a little physics. I studied three semesters of physics when I was a student, and I kept it up. So I know a little physics, but when I'm in a room with physicists, I, I got to I, you, you understand? I can't say much. As a philosopher, however, it's very different. I see them hassling about problems that I know more about than they do in any field. So I can go to any building in the university and I hear them stuck on not the content, which I don't know much about, but the approach. They don't know that they're chopping things up into little units and reconstructing them. If they knew that, there are certain problems that they have that they're totally confused about, which I know all about. All right, that's philosophy. Okay. I, this time I said it. So where do we start communicating to the other half of the world? Oh, I wish it was half. Uh, <laughs> It's never too clear where to start, because there is no start. But I will very quickly say, um, if we respect all these approaches and still know that they're conceptual approaches and they have to be related to whatever that is that we like to call experience, whatever that is, which when I say it's not it, you know, if we know that we're relating different approaches to that, then 
that's where I come in. See, that's where I'm ahead of the game with other philosophers. Now, we have had in this century two very great philosophers who said something that helps here. So I'm going to tell you very roughly. And again, anything I say is not it. You know, it takes a bunch of years to study these philosophers. And in fact, it takes so long that the people who really understand one of these philosophers are so specialized that you can't even talk to them. And they can't talk to you. They talk to each other. And, uh, and, and they're very stuck. But uh, well, really, and some of them are my good friends. <laughs> but one of these two philosophers was Heidegger, and the other one was Wittgenstein. And one of the things which I think is very deep and basic that Heidegger tried to bring is something that he called openness. And he tried to say over and over again, that philosophy and science and poetry all dip into this same openness. <coughs> and I'm quiet because after that, there isn't much to say if you, see, if you get it. And that's something that got totally lost in current philosophy. I mean, I, what's currently going on has taken from him just the negative side of that. That means you can't say anything, right? <laughs> All right. But the openness as openness, the way he meant, we can all tap into. OK. The other one was Wittgenstein. And what he showed, and pretty much showed on every page of his major book, you just have to open it and you see he's doing that. But people don't get it. What he showed is that language operates in a situation. And so if you take the words, they don't have their own meaning. You look them up in the dictionary and you get sort of a rump. And even then, they have to give you uses of it, sentences. Uh, words acquire fresh meaning every time they're used in every situation. Okay, so when I say these things here in the focusing space, they're going to have meanings that they wouldn't have if I said them next week. And words are always like that. Well, the message from that that the Wittgensteinian scholars uh, get out of it is, again, that you can't really say anything. <laughs> and when Wittgenstein said that words acquire new meaning in a situation, that is roughly, uh, if you want to throw it out, called conceptualism. And conceptualism is something that philosophers throw out. Why? Because after that, you can't do anything. The words don't have the same meaning in different situations, and, and they don't know how to get into context. Do, do you follow me? Well, I do. I know how to get into context. And not by being simple-minded and just saying something and saying, that's context. Uh, and there, I have to just claim now. Uh, if I've made sense up to now, I'm doing well. I just have to claim that I have a highly technical two actually highly technical pieces of work that run through hundreds of pages for doing this because something funny happens to concepts if you relate them to 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 this there's a kind of a, circ a spiral that they come out different and then they come out different again and you have to know how that works and there's a kind of logic that's not logical mm -hmm.